Matthew is the first book in the New Testament in which Jesus wrote with a red ink pen. Matthew 1. I was so uh, green when I got born again that when somebody would have said that, I would have thought Jesus had a red ink pen. <laughs> you know, I didn't know. I didn't know Sikkim from come here about the Bible. And I'd only looked at stories. and You know, my dad had somehow got manipulated into buying two giant Bibles, a big white one and a big red one from a salesman. I thought that was probably the greatest miracle I'd saw until I was 19 was my dad buying Bibles. <laughs> and they sat under the coffee table, and uh, I'd pull the, the red one out because it was the story Bible. And I would look through the stories, and uh, I would see the pictures of David and Goliath and Noah's Ark and, and uh, you know, that girl that took that spike and drove it through that man's head while he was sleeping. Man, there's problems back then, too. <clears throat> I'm seeing all this walking through. Then I saw how they dealt with Jesus and put him on the cross. And as a young man, I thought, this, this book is violent, you know. This is rough. And, and then I, when I got born again, I started reading the White Bible. And it started making sense to me. It's amazing how the Bible made no sense to me till. I became a child of his. And then it was like a love letter to me. And things started opening up. Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy. Uh, the Bible's not afraid. You know, it's such a big deal today, a heritage and people checking on their genealogy and where they came from. I think we could all trace ourselves back to this part and then go back to Adam and Eve. And so you realize that we're all dysfunctional. We, we all have... Uh, things to deal with in life and we all got <coughs> relatives that we don't want to talk about and some of them go to church with us would you stand with me <laughs> this morning I want to get I want to be able to give you some perspective on the wisdom of God that I discovered if we just walk through communion which is a mystery to me and you start seeing the blood and the body and how, how it breaks down and the importance of, of, of blood in our lives, the covering of blood. Blood makes people squeamish. It, it's, uh, um, it's, 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 you want to stay away from it, and yet without it, no flesh lives. Uh, without the blood covering us, no one makes it to heaven. It's, it's that which cures us. He, he's Christ the cure. But backing up a little bit, Matthew 1 verse 18 says, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, I know that's not a common thread in today's thing. You know, it's all about embarrassing one another on Facebook or somewhere else and slandering and, and getting as many as folk as you can together. Uh, but that's not the way Joseph did it. He wanted to be private in this because his wife was pregnant. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And I am and I, and I not want to beat this to death, guys, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. Mary had children. At, she, she did not die a virgin. Just say it. And let you deal with it. And he gave him the name Jesus. Key verse here, verse 20. And after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary at home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Uh, what God was doing was getting Joseph lined up 
Uh, if you'll watch and walk with me, and I'll do this as briefly as I can because I, I have limited time here. But we're going to walk from Genesis, and we're going to work this thing through. And I want to show you something. Have you ever played uh, where you hide the bean in the three shells, and you hide it, and you move it around? And those guys are real good with it. You'll never figure it out. Well, this is what God did. He took a seed, and he hid it, and then Joseph didn't realize that he was a part of that. And then so God had to show up in a dream and tell him, hey, son, this woman you got that you want to marry, you need to keep her because what's inside? I mean, hiding something in her. Pastor Rick said something that was powerful. God's not hiding it uh, from you. He's hiding it for you. Amen. There are certain things that God's done. And so this is the amazing mystery. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, your anointing is so important on my life. I ask, Lord, that you speak through me, Lord, and let our people, your people, hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord would say to the church. In Jesus' name. And everyone shout. Amen. 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 Be seated. Put on your seatbelt. Amen. Key words here. There's some key words as you're moving through these thoughts. There's succession, transition, generational, impartation, uh, perpetuation. Well, when I'm, when I'm on my bike, I'm thinking a lot. And we rode about 1,200 miles in three days. And uh, when, when, when uh, Brother David was talking about endurance, I was thinking about that thought yesterday as, as uh, again, <laughs> I found myself working in the seat just a little bit. And, uh, but, but I think about succession. What's going to happen next? Uh, what's going to go? What, because life is precious and you got to live life. You can't sit back and, and encase it and, and, plan, and thinking about it. You got to live this thing, man. And, and that and it's important and to live this thing is risky. So there has to be an understanding of transitions, amen, generations, impartation. God gave me children for a reason. There has to be something passed down and who I am needs to be passed to them. And this is what God did. It's defining. I want to talk about alignment here. It's so important to get things lined up. Last week we talked about the church and the importance of the church and, and why God, why there's a need for a church. And you need to get that message if you didn't catch it last week. This week we're going to talk about the, uh, aligning the church and getting the church in line. It's the point of forming alliance. Now, it's stronger than agreement. When you get aligned, it's stronger than just agreeing. You can agree with someone that you are not aligned with. Uh, I, I'm, politically, some of you are agreeing with one of the candidates, I'm sure. And, but in so doing, you're not aligned with everything that they believe. You just agree that you want them to be the one. To align is to join forces, forming and forging an alliance, thus creating a movement through combining resources. The church is it's so important because what we've done here is we've come together and we have combined our resources, the financial resources. We have combined our, uh, uh, our resources uh, uh, spiritually, uh, uh, talent-wise. And when we do that, we create a movement. Everybody said a movement. So when this happens, it, when you could do this, when you get it lined up, it comes from the word line. We would use the word lineage to pass down something. Line, lineage, align, alliance. Co it's covenant language. And there is a need to stay in alignment. You know, if you don't stay in alignment with the things that are going on around you, you go around a sharp curve and lose it. You could you you get you get it hit just right. Your vehicle is out of line. I have never had a vehicle if I drive it long enough hop back in line. I look at my kids and say, now look, that car is out of line up front. That tire is going to wear out and it's going to pop. All right. And they'll keep driving it. And pretty soon, guess what? It's going to pop. You've got to fix it again. The church is the same way. There are times that God will come in and supernaturally get us lined up again. Have you ever felt that during a conference or, or Sunday morning or Tuesday, or Tuesday where God just came in and began to line you up one more time? And, and, and you thought to yourself, you came in here a little wobbly. I mean, most of us could tell the rubber was gone some. We could hear you talk knowing something was skipping. And so you get in here and you get lined up again and God starts straightening. That's the great thing about the house of God. The scripture says, examine yourself. That's why we did communion this morning. Examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. Check yourself out. I can't, shouldn't. It's not my, my place in life to do it. I know some preachers think they're called to do it. I am not a fruit inspector. I'm not going to run to your house. I'm not going to yell, hide the beer. The preacher's here. Amen. It's not going to happen in your life. I'm going to just show and tell you on, on Sundays and Tuesdays and when I can, get yourself lined up. Amen. God's coming back for a church without spot or, or blemish or any such wrinkle. Amen. So the covenant begins in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God declares his intention. God's, uh, uh, God's uh, uh, intentions are so important. When you find it, he'll work it throughout Scripture. Here was his intention. Genesis 3, 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. 
talking to the devil here, and between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, when I first read that, it's like it's foreign language to me until I understood about the heel of Christ being bruised on the cross and that what the cross did against Satan himself. But Satan understood this revelation that there was going to be a seed that was going to move through history that one day was going to destroy him or be his demise. So he knew that was coming. So he did everything he could to try to stop the seed. When the seed moved through uh, during the time of Moses, Moses is in the river Nile. Why is that? Because it was put in the heart of the pharaohs to kill all the firstborn children. Then we get into the time of Herod and the time of Christ being born. And what does he do? Same thing, infanticide. Every three-year-old boy from, from, from the time he was three down in, in, in the Bethlehem area was killed. Why? He was hunting for the seed. He puts it in the mind of evil men to do these kind of things. And so there's trying to be a destruction. The thing is, is God smarter than that? Everybody say God's smarter than that. See, again, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Look at here, when Matthew 1, verse 5, backing up a little bit, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. So there are three women here mentioned. Watch the wisdom of God. If you want to hide something, put it where nobody else will think about looking for it. Right? So here goes God, and he moves the seed. I tell you what, let's put the seed in a prostitute. No one will think about looking there. This is what I love about God. He, he not, he's not pharisaical. He, he's not, he's not self-righteous. God will take something that's a mess and make it into a message. He'll take a trial and turn it into a triumph. These just ain't cliches. This is God bringing something up out of the, out of the heap in the ashes. So he finds a woman hanging out in Jericho by the name of, of Rahab who had a red light over her door, and it was the only way she could provide for herself. You know, guys, I talk about this every now and then. I want you to hear it again. My grandmother was a bootlegger. She took care of her daughter who, was, uh, who had had a, a drug overdose given to her when she was younger and, and almost died and had lived with the, the effects of a stroke. She had no one to take care of her. Every husband she married beat her to the point my uncle went and tried to kill one of them with a hawk bill knife. I have the newspaper clippings. My mother does. I watched this happen, and I've heard church people condemning my grandma for bootlegging. And I think to myself, that was the only trade she knew that could provide for her and her daughter by not turning to the government and getting the government to take care of her. And I think of this woman Rahab, and many times we look at people and we, we condemn them because of their lifestyles, and we say, well, it's Rahab. She was a prostitute. Shame on her. She used what she could to provide for her family. But after she met those spies that snuck into that house, and she said, hey, remember me when y'all circle this place and God take, because I heard about your God. Amen. I heard about the crossing of the Jordan. I heard you guys screaming over there when y'all circumcised yourself. That was an amazing thing. Amen. I ain't saying she did, but I, I'm sure she got an email. Uh, but, but, but she knew about these guys. And so when the, when the walls went down, she had that red scarlet cord hanging out. Everybody say the blood. See, yeah, there's no mysteries here. I mean, it's a mystery, but, but there's no secret to us believers. That red cord symbolized the blood of Christ over her doorpost, just like it did in the book of Exodus over the other doors that, that the death angel flew over. So here, when the walls go down, her place stands. She marries one of these guys. Little did the devil know that God took the seed and ran it through her. He'll never look here. So he ran it through. Then he went through Ruth, who was gathering grain, who was just kind of ostracized in a lot of ways off to the side. And yet she never gave up. She believed God for, for a time such as, as that, even at, like Esther, for a time as this. So God brought Ruth through here, and, and he stuck those guys. Uh, what was Ruth's husband? Boaz. Amen. And then, and then the Bathsheba. Oh, sin, sin, sin. Here's David at the wrong place, wrong time, looking at the wrong thing. And he sees uh, Bathsheba. What was she doing? Well, what, what's her name? Taking a bath. <laughs> I'm telling you, God is cool, man. <laughs> he, he, he worked things out. <laughs> and 
David got himself in a, in a mess. But what the world didn't see and the devil didn't see, God took that temptation and ran a seed through it. And nobody saw it coming. And through Bathsheba, her tenth son, Solomon, came a little the seed of David. That's why when the angel talked to Joseph, he said, Joseph, son of David. He had to remind him who he was. Sometimes God's got to remind you who and whose you are. Amen. To help get you lined up one more time. So God hid the seed. He disguised the passage in wounds of destiny. Hey, it didn't just pass through these three ladies. It passed through Sarah. It passed through Rebecca. It passed through Rachel. Guess the problem with Sarah, Rachel, and Rebecca? They were all barren. If you want to move a seed, move it through someone that can't have children. And yet they did have children. I mean, this that you, you, you cannot carry. But here they are. Mary wasn't in the lineage of Abraham or of David. She was called in by God. And she was connected to Joseph. Amen. So you have to trace the line. If you can teach kids, it's from the earliest times in kindergarten. You'll see dot, 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 dot. And you'll give that kid a crayon and watch them. They'll go here and here and here and here and here. And you don't know what it is until it shows up. But if you could take the dots here and begin to trace them, it would lead you to a little baby in the manger. Amen. And they would all connect and you realize who Christ really is here. The key verse here again, Joseph, son of David. He reminds him of his lineage. Joseph almost missed it. He almost divorced the mother of the son of God. Amen. God had to straighten him up and say, son, stay the course. Everybody say, stay the course. So the genealogy of Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David, Jacob saw it and wanted it more than Esau. Esau compromised and lost. David did not ask for it, but he recognized it when he, when, when he was called, and it stayed with him for 20 years of living in caves. And then we find 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. God's about kingdom establishment. That's why Jesus came is to show us the kingdom of God. It wasn't just about heaven. Amen. So here comes, it all came through David. It's always through the one who you don't expect. He's illegitimate. David is. And God chose him. This to me is such a profound statement and profound uh, uh, message is this, guys. Some of you thought God didn't care about you. He didn't care about you. You come out of, about a channel view. Or you came up out of Dayton. You came up out of Crosby. And what, how would God... But God looks at us so different than what we look at ourselves. And he said, I can use you and your situation and where you're at and what you came from, your sins, your messes, and your mess-ups, and I can turn it for my good. Amen. Amen. That's the power of God. So Mary was not in line, but they had to adjust. Everybody say adjust. adjust. Every now and then you just want to look at your kids and say, would you just adjust? <laughs> Don't you want to do that? I mean, you just want to, you, you, you want to get them lined back up and adjust them. Now, here, here's the powerful thing to me. Psalm 22, verse 30 says, And David had a revelation. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare the righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. God, again, took a seed, and he began to work that thing through, and he got it through David, and he just kept right on through the thing until he got up in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said, But who do you say? And this is the, this is the prophetic question for everybody in here. Who do you say that I am? Who do you believe that Jesus really is? And then all of a sudden, uh, of course, uh, the man Peter said to him, Simon Peter answered, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, uh, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and that whatsoever you uh, bind on earth shall be bound on earth, whatever you bind in heaven will be bound in heaven. Even whatever you loose shall be loose. It, is, it was not Peter's 
confession that allows him the opportunity to get the keys. It was his revelation. Amen. Amen. It's what he understood. And this is the thing. I, I, I don't want to ever get into a Gnostic thinking here. Gnosticism ruled uh, the Middle East. It still permeates our American culture. Gnosticism says knowledge is greater than anything else. The more you know, then, then the greater you are, and you become a super saint. I don't want you to get into that. I want you to understand some spirituality that, that's connected with revelation, but you still got to have some knowing. The knowing is important. The reason I say Gnosticism is uh, any heresy is, an ex- is a truth carried too far. That's all it is. The Mormon church is full of truth, but much of it is carried too far. Uh, Jehovah's Witness carried too far. Uh, a lot of the Pentecostals, Church of Christ, a lot of our denominations that we run with, they got truths, but they'll carry it too far. They'll beat you over the head with it. And they just stay on it, stay on it. So it's important to have knowledge. Knowledge is important for us. But when, when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, anointed one. Because there were a lot of Jesuses. How many know we still got a lot of Jesuses today? Uh, you meet them all the time. You know, if, it, if it's a Hispanic name, it's Jesus. We, we meet Jesuses all the time. But we don't meet Christ. So he says, thou art the Christ. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, Barabbas' name was also a, a, a Jesus name, Baraba, son of the Father. So there were a lot of Jesuses. So here he goes, he says, Thou art the Christ, the anointed one, prophet, priest, king. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus lit up like a light bulb and he said, Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven gave you the revelation. And upon this what? Revelation, this understanding, we'll build the church. So we build the church based on who Christ is. And when you understand who he is, it begins to, it gets, it gets the cogs rolling inside you. I pray when you come to church that your gears start rolling and you start getting back in line again. You start realizing, you know what? I am a son. I'm a daughter of God. Amen. Now, here's the thing. When I got born again, y'all were calling each other brother and sister. I didn't understand brother and sister. I had a brother and a sister. Y'all were not them. <laughs> what I did not understand was this power of the seed. The seed, God gave us mustard seed faith. He said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you say in the mountain, be thou removed and be removed. I got a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it. Amen. And you believe God and you throw that thing out there. And you understand one of the most powerful things in life is not what is already manifested, but it's the seed that brought it there. It's the seed in the apple that brought the orchard. Amen. It, 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 the seed, it was the seed that brought you here. Somebody had a happy time and you showed up. That's how God does stuff. Come on, can I get an amen? If it wasn't fun, you wouldn't be here, believe me. See, y'all get too spiritual sometimes. I have to <laughs> pull y'all back in here so you understand what I'm talking about. So the seed began to move from Genesis. It moved all the way through the prostitute Rahab. It moved through Bathsheba, the, 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 uh, the affair with David. It just keeps on moving. Then it gets to Joseph, then, then into Mary. But now it leaves us kind of stranded because it stops with Jesus. But then we get born again. Everybody say born again. Go, go to the next slide, sis. I, I don't know where I'm at. And who knows? Peter said, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Well, that's a given. <laughs> that you should show more the praises of him who with what? Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, now, hold on just a minute. This revelation is powerful because it puts us in line. When I get, begin to understand that I am a chosen generation, that I am a part of a royal priesthood, you, you don't under, you, you, you're a priest. Which means you got a direct line between you and God. Amen. You can talk to, you don't have to go through me or any other mediator. You talk straight to Jesus. Amen. Amen. So that, that's a powerful thing. A peculiar people. And we should show forth our praise. Why are we giving God praise? Because we found out we're part of a family. And this thing, this seed, is a spiritual seed we receive by faith. And we get the Father's DNA inside of us. I did not know I had such a large family till I got born again. Now, so some of you, you say, well, this ain't no great, great revelation. It is if you think hard enough that God did all of this and hid it from the devil, and the devil never saw it. Right. Amen. And even the devil trying to take Jesus out was bringing Jesus in. Right. That they didn't put, they didn't, they didn't bury Jesus in a tomb. They planted him. And three days later, he bloomed. 
This seed is a powerful thing. Oh, you want more threes? Uh, Genesis chapter 3, I think it is. It talks about on the third day. Uh, it's one of them chapters. But it's the third day that God put seed, time, and harvest. If you planted a seed, gave it some time, it'd bring forth a harvest. So we are the lineage of God in line on earth with the seed of God inside of us. And your place in this life, and don't miss this, is to pass this down to the next generation. If we do not pass this to the next generation, if they don't understand by faith, they are the DNA of God. Amen. They are spiritually connected to heaven. I mean, we've missed this thing. Galatians tells us this. Now to Abraham and what his seed or the promises made. He said not and, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before, I should have put this in the NIV for you, before of God in Christ the law, which was for, keep rolling, for, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Therefore, it serves the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed could come to whom the promise was made. Keep going. Amen. Galatians. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Come on up, Joseph. Here's the thing, guys. We'll close with this. When I first got born again, there was this understanding among, among people that I ran with that there were Gentiles and Jews. And that if you were not a Jew, you did not get a promise that they were God's special people. Now, I'm going to say this to you. I believe keep your eyes on Israel. I believe God has a special affection for Israel. I believe he loves the Jews. I, I believe that they, they've been through hell and high water. But then when you got born again, you are not a second-class citizen of the kingdom of God. That God grafted you in to the very tree. When you graft something in, it grows from the same fruit from the root that it was grafted into. That when you got born again, God put you in. You became an heir. Everybody say heir. See, I've never, my dad just passed. You know that. My mom is of age. I have a brother. But here's one thing. It never crosses my mind. I never think about inheritance. Never did. And the reason why is because, not out of shame, but it's just the way we were brought up. We never had anything. I mean, I have in the back of my car a red level made out of wood, Kenny, that my dad used to level uh, bricks with and, and wood with. And, and I went through the house, and they said, you want anything? I said, yeah, I want that red level. Because it reminds me that my dad is a builder, and he built stuff. That's all I want is that red level. And I have that red level, and I'll, I'll pass it down to one of my kids. But then I think about the heir, being an heir of God, of all the things that he has. The only thing you're going to get to bring from this life to the next life is friends and family. That's it. But when I get there, what does God have prepared for us? What does he have? Revelation, uh, Acts says, and then Peter began to speak. I now realize, yeah, just, just hold on, I got to get my, I got to flow this thing. Peter gets to the end of, of uh, sharing on Revelation. And, and I think sometimes this is also important. If you're uneducated, as I was, and I know you think, well, he's got a bachelor's degree. Guys, you have no idea how hard that was. <laughs> For a man that's uneducated and from the South, as I am. I just we didn't know it. I had to learn it. Peter was an uneducated fisherman, and he caught the revelation. I knew a preacher in Leoma, Tennessee, by the name of Smith. Pat, he was a neat, neat fella. He would dance in his overalls. He was just a country farmer that God raised up. He had no education. And when he got saved, he could read the Bible. But only the Bible. I roomed with this man going to a funeral. And I woke up with him reading out of the Bible. He would read it out loud every morning. He couldn't read other books. He could read the Bible. And I'd scratch my head over that. You don't have to believe that. I ain't asking you to. I, I, I stayed in the same room with the man. I heard him reading. He, and I knew of his testimony of his life. God did something crazy for him. 
Or the guy had a, went in a coma, woke up and started speaking Spanish. I'm thinking, if I got Spanish in here, I wish it'd start working. <laughs> See? <laughs> Verse 34, Acts 10. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from what? Every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Stand with me. God accepts people from every nation. Do you know what the blood does? It abolishes racism. You've heard me say there's only one race. There's a lot of pigments, but there's only one race. We all have different color. I've never met a white man. Hello. The ones I listen to, y'all red or tan or some of y'all are, never mind. <laughs> you know, but we use the term red and white and yellow. But there's only one race, the human race, and there's many nations. And God, through his blood, begins to tear down those walls. That's what Ephesians tells us. These are tremendous uh, revelations and understandings that one catches by reading through the Word of God. But God took a seed and He hid it. Now let me tell you where it's at right now. It's in you. You're carrying the divine seed of God, the DNA of heaven. Your, your blood is so important to Him. Amen. Blood is so important that when, when Cain killed Abel, the scripture says Abel's blood talked from the ground. It had power in it. There's power in that blood. We took communion today. We, we, I believe if you did, then you're born again. That by faith, your sins have been washed away. You're as clean today as the first day you ever accepted Christ. That's what I believe. I believe it by faith. I also believe by faith you're carrying the seed of God inside of you. Does that make you special? Only to God. Don't think of yourself more than you ought. But know this. We're all now brothers and sisters. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God, let revelation fill this place. Give us an understanding, Lord, that, that through divine wisdom you hid the seed from Genesis all the way to the New Testament. You did it because you loved us. You did it because you wanted a family. No grandchildren, just sons and daughters. I thank you, Lord, for this house. I thank you for the blood. I thank you for your blessings in our life. Now, Lord, I ask that you take this word and impart it to us and help us to get ourselves in line with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.